We are pleased to have today David Crane with us. I should mention that uh, a variety of people on campus are sponsoring his visit, including the David M. Kennedy Center for International Studies, the International Relations Program, uh, the American Constitutional Society over at the Law School, and the College of Family, Home, and Social Sciences. Mr. Crane is most notable, in my view, for having indicted Charles Taylor, the warlord who was arrested 10 days ago, uh, one of Africa's most notorious warlords and one of the most bloodthirsty killers of the past 100 years, though he has a lot of competition there as well. And uh, so we're very pleased to, uh, to have David with us today to, uh, to speak to us about efforts to achieve justice in West Africa. Mr. Crane was the chief prosecutor of the Sierra Leone War Crimes Tribunal for three years from its inception in 2002, was it, until 2005. Before that, he also had a, uh, 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 held a number of senior positions within the U.S. government, especially the Defense Department, and was also an instructor at the Judge Advocate General School. Um, and so we're very pleased to welcome him here today. Well, this reminds me of Sierra Leone in, uh, during the rainy season. Uh, you get rain like this all the time, don't you? I didn't think you would. But uh, anyway, it's, uh, it's great to be in Utah. I, it was 44 years ago that I was actually here uh, uh, in uh, Dugway Proving Grounds. My dad was an Army officer assigned there, and uh, uh, I remember it uh, very well, but it's been too long. So it's great to, to have the opportunity to come out to you uh, and visit and, uh, and chat with you about international criminal law, and particularly uh, uh, one of the minor success stories going on for on behalf of uh, many, many victims uh, in, in West Africa. Uh, I'm going to speak a little bit, but certainly I would like and certainly encourage a, a good, robust dialogue afterwards so we can uh, answer uh, questions for you and, and, and allow you to get a perspective because uh, it's very, very important. I also want to thank the, the David M. Kennedy uh, School as well as uh, Professor Hawkins and, and all the others who have allowed me to, to come out here uh, and enjoy your reign, but also this beautiful campus. I've never been here before, and I'm just absolutely uh, impressed. I speak at a lot of universities, and uh, this one's way up there. And it's nice you to have those mountains, too. That's pretty. I got in late last night. I didn't even see them. So I got up this morning to run, and all of a sudden I walk out the front door, and I almost tripped over the, uh, the curb uh, looking up as opposed to looking down as I should have. So you know, we, don't, we don't have many physical mountains in Washington, D.C. We've got many mountains in Washington, D.C. Uh, <laughs> but we certainly don't have any physical mountains like that. So, again, uh, what a beautiful campus. What a beautiful place for you to live and learn and uh, uh, and to be able to go out and, and take that learning and, and make a difference. And hopefully you'll have that opportunity, uh, like I had the pleasure and the honor of doing that for 33 years of public service. Well, let me begin by describing to you a very warm day in March of 2004. Uh, as a part of our town hall program begun in September of 2002, I was in McKinney, uh, which was really the headquarters of the notorious Revolutionary United Front, listening to my clients tell me what the conflict in Sierra Leone was all about, how the court and my office, the office of the prosecutor, were doing from their point of view, and then to answer any and all questions posed by the assembled citizens in the hall. Kind of like this, just right here. The number was assigned, estimated to be around 300 Sierra Leoneans. Not an uncom uncommon turnout, for these type of events. During the course of the meeting, a young woman holding a child stood up waiting to ask a question to make, and to make a comment. After answering the question at hand, I turned to her to allow her to speak. This young Sierra Leonean woman was missing a large part of her face. Her burn scars radiated down her shoulder, chest, and arms. Blinded by her, from her horrific injuries, through cracked lips, she whispered to me, the rebels did this to me. Do something about what they have done here. Seek justice. As I walked the entire countryside of this tortured country, I listened to hundreds 
of these types of statements. And so it allowed me to go back to Freetown where my headquarters was as I was investigating and drafting the indictments against individuals such as Charles Taylor and uh, others to seek justice for this young woman who was your age, uh, who had no hope, uh, no life, and nothing for her child to try to help establish the rule of law which would give Sierra Leone a possibility of moving forward into the future. The Special Court for Sierra Leone is a recognized hybrid international war crimes tribunal set up by the United Nations on behalf of the international community and the Republic of Sierra Leone to try those who bear the greatest responsibility for war crimes and crimes against humanity and other violations of international humanitarian law during the decade-long conflict in Sierra Leone in the 1990s. This bold new experiment in international criminal law initially began after Sierra Leone asked the United Nations to consider setting up a tribunal to investigate and prosecute individuals responsible for the atrocities committed in that lush tropical country. In August of 2000, the United Nations Security Council authorized the Secretary General to explore the possibilities of setting up the tribunal. In January of 2002, the Under Secretary General of Legal Affairs, Hans Corell, and the Attorney General of Sierra Leone at the time, Solomon Barua, signed the International Treaty creating the Special Court for Sierra Leone. Subsequently, the Republic of Sierra Leone passed the appropriate legislation ratifying that treaty. The next generation of International War Crimes Tribunal was born. In April, the Secretary General appointed me to be the prosecutor and Robin Vincent from the United Kingdom as acting registrar. Early that summer of 2002, Sierra Leone nominated Desmond De Silva, who is a Queen's Counsel also from the United Kingdom, to be the deputy prosecutor, and he was confirmed in the fall. Desmond De Silva now is the prosecutor. Uh, he took my place when I left that post in July of 2005 and will be the individual who will actually prosecute Charles Taylor. The registrar and an advance team from my office arrived in Sierra Leone in July, followed shortly by myself on 6 August of 2002. According to plan, we began our investigations two weeks later on 19 August of 2002 with a team of Sierra Leonean and international investigators. We have not stopped and will continue that until the trials are done. Since then, we have issued 13 indictments. Two indictees have since died, one by natural causes, that's Fodi Sanko of a pulmonary embolism, and the other murdered by Charles Taylor, Samuel Bockery, in May of 2003. Of the 11 outstanding indictments, 10 are in custody, in trial or awaiting various joint criminal trials, uh, and one remains at large, Johnny Paul Coroma, who we have or believe who is dead, also murdered by Charles Taylor. All of the major players in this terrible, horrific conflict are accounted for, and their trials are finishing as I speak, and Charles Taylor's trial will begin very shortly. The special court has four organs of the court. There are the office of the prosecutor, which I head, the office of the registrar, which is someone who is like the clerk of court who runs the court on a daily basis, the chambers, consisting of two trial chambers and then a supreme chamber called the appellate chamber, and the office of the principal defender. The presiding judge for the current uh, trial against Charles Taylor is Judge Lasiuk, and the president of the court, who is the senior judge of the Special Courts Appellate Division is Emmanuel Ayula of Nigeria. Now, the trial chambers are a mix of two international judges and one Sierra Leonean judge, which makes it the hybrid aspect of, of, of the case itself. And the appellate chamber has five judges, four from the international community and one from Sierra Leone. And, of course, the court, very importantly, sits in Sierra Leone, where the people of Sierra Leone can certainly see justice done before their eyes. I'll digress. If you saw Charles Taylor landing in the court compound in that 
Russian MI-8 helicopter on CNN. What you don't hear is the cheers of the Sierra Leonean people as he steps off that airplane and is being escorted into his jail cell, which was literally right across the street from my office. Uh, my former special assistant uh, called me uh, and told me that that is missing, but literally uh, there were people in the hills all around the courts complex and standing on the roofs of, of their homes uh, cheering uh, when they really realized that the, the central point in this tragedy of this joint criminal enterprise was finally in custody for a fair trial. It, it was a special day uh, for all of Africa and, in my mind, mankind uh, when, he was, uh, when he was put in custody last Wednesday and arraigned before the world uh, just uh, two days ago. Now, I've had the, the luxury now, after three and a half years of literally living, breathing, tasting, touching, feeling, and smelling uh, this tragedy, to reflect on some of the lessons that we've learned. And I think this is what the important aspect of this is, is that we do have a very successful tribunal in West Africa. And the question that begs the question, actually, is uh, what are the lessons and uh, why did you succeed so quickly and efficiently uh, where we have some challenges with our sister tribunals uh, in Rwanda uh, and Arusha? You know, the world became frustrated around 2000 uh, about the enormous costs of international justice. Uh, when Sierra Leone requested our assistance in setting up a tribunal, the Secretary General and the Security Council began to consider various ways of how international justice should be administered fairly, efficiently, and effectively. This court, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, is the result. And I, I believe, uh, in a rare situation, the international community actually got this right. Now, why is that? Well, the mandate of the court is achievable. The mandate for the court is prosecute those who bear the greatest responsibility for war crimes and crimes against humanity. That is a workable mandate for a chief prosecutor. It is something that I can get done in three to five years uh, and get out, because it's very important for a tribunal, very much like Nuremberg, to get on with its business and leave. The people of the country need to put this behind them in a way that's fair and just, but certainly they have to get on with their lives as well. So I believe that, in reality, greatest responsibility is the key to the success of any future international tribunal, to include the International Criminal Court. And my good friend, Luis Marino Acampo, the chief prosecutor of the ICC, firmly believe this as well, and that is the standard now that we'll probably see uh, as far as prosecuting individuals who commit such horrific atrocities uh, is the greatest responsibility. Now, it's not perfect. But if you understand that in a tribunal situation, and in an international tribunal, they are creatures of political events, usually some type of atrocity, war, conflict, what have you, and they are created due to political compromise. The great political compromise that created this international tribunal in West Africa was greatest responsibility. If that would not have been put in the mandate, most of the major uh, signatories at the UN Security Council would not have supported it, and hence we would not have seen a tribunal at all to seek justice for the individuals who died and were maimed so horribly. You know, it's interesting, uh, but the result of 12 years of conflict in Liberia and in Sierra Leone uh, amounted to the m murder, rape, maiming, and mutilation of over 1.2 million human beings. That's half the population of Utah. If you add the 2.5 million internally displaced, that means literally leaving as their homes are being burned to the ground, seeking other shelter, uh, in a constant motion for 10 years, you can understand the devastation of what took place in Sierra Leone. So the mandate of the court is achievable. Mo greatest responsibility. What happens if you change one word from greatest responsibility to most responsible? The amount of individuals that I would indict, greatest responsibility, was around 20. And we did, as I said, take, took about 20 of those individuals off the street. They're indicted, dead, or they're working for the office of the prosecutor. 
But if you change that to most responsible, that changes the equation incredibly. I can do the prosecution in three to five years with around 20 individuals. However, if you change to, to most responsible, it goes to between 100 and 300 individuals. To do it fairly and appropriately under international law, that would take about 20 years. And of course, that is certainly too long, and the people of Sierra Leone and West Africa would never have been able to put this behind them. Unfortunately, this is the challenge of Rwanda. They're not scheduled to finish their work completely until 2015, 20 years after the tragedy that took place uh, in Rwanda. That is a very dangerous precedent and one that we will not see uh, in the future. However, I'm not certainly disparaging the hard work of the wonderful people in Arusha indeed, but their mandate is wrong. If you dropped most responsible from the, uh, from the mandate and just said those responsible, that jacks it up to 30,000 people, approximately. I don't know the exact number. I could be off 25 percent either way. But the point is, is you kind of understanding where this is all going, don't you? It's impossible. It's impossible to prosecute all of them. So in order to ensure that something is done versus nothing is done, you're going to see in the future greatest responsibility as the standard by which we can prosecute those who started it all, aided and abetted, sustained it. And uh, I think that that is an important principle. Something very similar to Nuremberg. Uh, the International Military Tribunal at, in Nuremberg also had a very similar type of mandate. Uh, they prosecuted around 23 individuals of the greatest responsibility, got in, got out, and allowed Germany and the rest of Europe to move on. And I think it's just as fundamentally a principle today as it was 60 years ago. This is the 60th anniversary of the end of the Nuremberg trials, which uh, uh, we will celebrate here in the fall. Now, another reason why this particular tribunal seems to be a success is that the time frame for, the, for it to achieve this mandate is workable. I said three to five years, and I really mean three to five years. After about five years, in my humble opinion, uh, the whole concept of the tribunal in the location, particularly in the location where you are, begins to unravel politically around the edges. And you saw this exactly what happened in Rwanda. Uh, the people were removed from uh, the trial. They did not understand what was going on, and uh, it was taking too long. And we saw Rwanda officially announcing that they were no longer going to cooperate with the very tribunal by which it was seeking justice for the citizens of Rwanda. That's a huge political problem, and it caused uh, the prosecutor for both uh, Arusha and The Hague to be removed from the ICTR, the International Criminal Tribunal of Rwanda, Carlo Del Ponte and Hassan Jallo being placed in because of this problem. So you've got to get in. One of the lessons we've learned and one of the lessons that I've uh, instructed uh, the international community is you've got to get in with a workable mandate that will get you in and get you out in less than five years. Another key aspect of why this particular tribunal is probably going to succeed is that you put it right in the scene of the crime. At the end of the day, it's for and about the people of Sierra Leone or wherever you are at to do your job. To see justice begin and end in a politically acceptable time frame, but to see it done right there before their very eyes is very, very crucial for their understanding that the rule of law is more powerful than the rule of the gun. Other keys to success of future tribunals, and one that worked very well in the Special Court for Sierra Leone, is the importance of an outreach and legacy program. Again, as I told you, ladies and gentlemen, this is for and about the people of where you are, in this case, Sierra Leone. What I did when I first got there is we started an outreach program, and I literally walked the countryside standing in front of the people of Sierra Leone, my client, in town hall meetings, which is a very American thing to do, isn't it? And it worked. I was able to listen. Not I wasn't lecturing them like I'm lecturing you here today. Uh, I was listening to them tell me what took place in the various part of the country that I was in. And for the next two and a half years, I went back up country all the time, explaining to them how their court, their court, 
was working and to listen to their concerns and comments so that I could take those back and adjust them. Because again, at the end of the day, it's their court and they're going to have to live with the result. Now you have to understand that this was a very much like watching Mel Gibson's very first movie, Mad Max Thunderdome. Imagine Provo, Utah, where there is no rule of law. You can do whatever you wish. It's literally the survival of the fittest. Of course, the results are horrific. Now, how do you get a people who have lived under the oppression of no law and corrupt regimes to come forward and understand that the law is fair, that no one is above the law, and truly the rule of law is more powerful than the rule of the gun. Well, you've got to go out and talk to them, listen to them, and let them see you and discuss with them their concerns related to this. And it's a huge challenge, but it has to be done. And I think that it was also very much one of the key principles which I've been discussing with other prosecutors and the UN related to successes. We're not perfect, by the way, and I'm not going to sit here and thump my chest as to how well we did. We had many challenges, but certainly these are lessons, certainly, that show that a possibly a key to a success of a future tribunal. Another key to success is legacy program. We have to leave something for them, not just the physical court and the, uh, the buildings and those type of things, but a well-trained cadre of trial counsel, paralegals, case managers, uh, prison guards, pol uh, investigators, what have you. And we've done that. A third of my office was from Sierra Leone. And not only did they provide great service, but they were learning how to try, manage, investigate complex cases. They will stay in Sierra Leone and will be the generation which will start that country back on the rule of law road. And these people are the ones that will do it. This is an important part of, and just an example uh, of our legacy program. There were many, many others. Another thing that we learned in the three years that I was there is that a truth commission, a truth and reconciliation commission, is critical for a sustainable peace. This is the first time in history where we had a truth commission and a tribunal operating at the same time and the same place. And there was a lot of concern that there was going to be a great deal of tension, they would not be able to work together, and that the people would become confused. And truth and justice, what is that, and uh, uh, who is first? Well, it turns out that it worked. And one of the reasons that we did, uh, that it was a general success, was the fact that I announced publicly that when I arrived, that I would use no evidence that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, a domestic institution, uh, I would use none of their evidence in my investigations and encourage the people of Sierra Leone and West Africa to come forward and to tell their stories. Because again, this was a very specific, complex criminal case with very specific elements of charges. And so I was going to have to build my case on my prosecutorial plan based on witnesses that would prove my case under international law. And so the people of Sierra Leone came forth by the tens of thousands to tell their story. Because in reality, that's all they really wanted to do. Isn't it the ultimate atrocity is that you have 1.2 million people go quietly into the night as if they never mattered? That's my mind as far as from a, a human point of view is that you don't matter and that your death doesn't matter and the way you died doesn't matter and the numbers who died doesn't matter. And so the Truth Commission as well as the Tribunal, but the Truth Commission allowed these people to come forth privately or publicly, but certainly officially, just to tell their stories. In the town hall programs that I, that I was a part of, all the people wanted to do was to tell me what took place and what happened to them. That in and of itself is some type of reconciliation process, though I have to tell you, I don't know how any human being could, in fact, move on with their life when you literally watch your entire family cut to pieces in front of you after they just finished raping your wife. How one can move forward with some type of life, I'm not sure, but certainly 
All we can do is what we can do. And so the Truth Commission allowed these people to come forward and tell that story and have it officially put on the record so that their families, their children, their wives, fathers, mothers, what have you, would not go quietly into the night. And I think it's so critical to have a Truth Commission because in my mind, and I've learned this now through the School of Hard Knocks being there, you have to have truth plus justice equals a sustainable peace. And if you have one of those missing, the peace that you may have may be illusory and may break down. So it's very critical. Another aspect that's very important because we want to show the people that, yes, the rule of law is more powerful than the rule of the gun, but we also have to show that the law is fair because you're trying to build up a respect for the law, not just going in there putting bad guys in jail because you have to understand that at the international level, there is no death penalty. So these individuals who are convicted uh, will serve a term of which amounts to life imprisonment. And each of the counts uh, call for a life imprisonment, but that's certainly up to the fact finder and the judges. But in order to show that the law is fair, you have to make sure that the defense teams are good, supported, and give a vigorous defense. And I was very much in support of that. The registrar developed for the first time in history the Office of the Public Defender to manage the defense teams and to ensure that they had all of the logistic support that was necessary for them to properly defend their client. This is very, very important because at the end of the day, you have to remember that if, in fact, these individuals are found guilty, and I can assure you they will be, then, and that's not meant to be a pejorative comment because the cases are very, very solid. My standard when you sign an indictment is usually uh, a, very, a much lower standard, a reason to believe. Uh, my standard to sign the indictments to include Charles Taylor's was beyond a reasonable doubt. You can't get this wrong. You can't make a mistake, and you certainly can't have these individuals from your prosecutorial point of view walk the streets again. Can you imagine Charles Taylor being re-let out after being acquitted. Now, he has a right to a fair trial, a vigorous defense, and uh, if the prosecutor doesn't do his job, proving it beyond a reasonable doubt, he could. But those are the things that go through your mind as you're signing that indictment, which we did in a very moving ceremony on the 3rd of March of 2003. We signed eight of the 13 indictments in my office, and I brought in all the prosecutors and all of the, the uh, investigators and my team that worked for the past seven months, seven days a week, about 18 hours a day. And I said, the ghosts of 100,000 people are standing in this room today. And particularly our Sierra Leonean colleagues were weeping openly because they could not imagine truly the rule of law had returned to West Africa. Very, very moving. But it's very, very important also that they get a fair trial to this. But again, the burden was on me to make sure that this was exactly right uh, so that they would, as I said publicly and privately, that they would never see the light of a free day again for what they had done to the people of Sierra Leone. Another key to success is, and it's uh, something as far as efficiency is concerned, we tapped unsuspected resources such as creating an academic consortium, bringing in law students from all over the world in their university settings in an academic ed program, providing us bench briefs, uh, memorandums supervised by a professor of law, uh, and providing us tens of thousands of hours and millions of dollars in attorney time to, uh, to back up our appellate teams and our trial teams on issues of law and policy. And that continues to this day and has been proven a huge success. Another key aspect of the Special Court for Sierra Leone is we were able to uh, call on nations to provide us in our secondment program experienced prosecutors and investigators at no cost to us to actually join the team. And we had people from all over the world, Canada, Germany, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and other parts of the world who came in and served a year, in some cases two, uh, at no cost to us and provided us great, great service. Now, what are the challenges that I faced while I was in West Africa? And I'll finish this up, and then I'd very much like to sit and talk to you and listen to your comments and questions. Uh, what were my challenges? My biggest challenge 
because this is not rocket science. Any of you could do this. It's called a plan, sticking to the plan, and working the plan. That's not rocket science. You could do this. It's good management 101. But what was my biggest challenge? Indifference. Nobody gave a damn. It's just 1.2 million West Africans. And how do you give, get the war-weary, war crimes-weary international community to give a damn? Literally, that was my challenge, and I traveled the world seeking political, diplomatic, and, of course, fundamentally financial support in a world that didn't care. Huge, huge challenge, a continuing challenge both for the International Criminal Court and future regional hybrid international war crimes tribunal. It's just so difficult, and I understand that. I was living, breathing it, tasting it, touching it, seeing it. And so a lot of my job was just advocacy, trying to describe to you. And as I described to the tribunal as I was giving the opening statement against the leadership of the dreaded Revolutionary United Front, you know, the guys that did the chopping, as they say, cut the hands, and they asked you, what would you want, short sleeve or long sleeve? They would either cut, you, cut your hand off at the wrist or cut your arm off just above the elbow. And I told the judges, as I was quoting Ignacy Schwartzbart, from, who wrote a letter to the World Jewish Congress in New York, trying to tell them that they really are killing all the Jews and many others. Because at the time, the world didn't care. And he just told them, you're going to have to believe the unbelievable. And that's what I told the tribunal judges, that you're going to have to believe the unbelievable. There is no language that can describe what took place in West Africa. Rwanda was a horrific tragedy, but what took place in West Africa took it to another degree, times actually it was exponential. I have never, and I have certainly traveled and lived in this world have never seen such horrors as I have seen in West Africa. Really unbelievable. And so I told the judges, you're going to have to listen to these witnesses. And they came in by the hundreds. Do you know we never lost one witness? Now, they were all protected. They all had numbers. Their names were never given. They were all behind a shield. But we never lost one witness. But they came in proudly, heads up, being carried in. Some of them didn't have legs. Blinded, maimed, mutilated, child soldiers, gender crime victims, pointing at these individuals, some of them with their stubs because they didn't have hands, saying, you did this to me. And having them and watching them walk out of the courtroom with their heads held high because they had done something for their families, for their victim, for the other victims, and for their country. And that is what, in my mind, is justice. And look at these guys across the room, these individuals. Have you ever looked at the devil? Have you ever looked into the eyes of Satan himself? Now, I was giving a briefing to Henry Hyde in the House International Relations Committee about a year after I was there. And he was uh, asking me about how, how it was going. And I said, you know, Mr. Chairman, the devil walks the earth, and he lives in West Africa. I have seen him, and I have looked into his eyes. Of course, when you look the devil in the eye, that leaves a burning impression upon you for the rest of your life right down to your very soul. But have you ever looked at a human being that has no soul? I can't describe it to you, and I will not attempt to do that. But these individuals, these devils incarnate, who were individually criminally responsible for this horror, had their heads down on their chest as these individuals walked by them and out of the courtroom. That is justice. 
Another key aspect of this is certainly reaching out not only to the international community, not only to the individuals in the tragedy, but also regionally as well, because again, you have to get the political support of the African leaders in West Africa itself. And now there are very other challenges, things like geographic distance, location, uh, the time it just took to move about in a land where there are no roads. You know, the, as I'm looking at these beautiful mountains, you see the trails? That was pretty much the interstate road system in Sierra Leone. And so when we had investigators going up country to interview witnesses, you know, they would only be 50, 60, 100 miles away. You know, Sierra Leone is only the size of South Carolina. It would take sometimes days. They would disappear into the bush for weeks. Of course, we had GPS and radio communications and survival packs and all of those things. But that was a huge challenge. Another was security. The beauty and success of it was, was that we were there. The challenge was we were there. A lot of, as we say, a lot of bad guys moving about. Not just the supporters of the indictees, but Russian mafia, Ukrainian mafia, Hamas, and yes, Al-Qaeda. And so you had to deal with these individuals, nobody who wanted you there. And everybody felt that you personally and your team were the ones that were causing the disruption of an entire illegal diamond industry to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. Blood diamonds are a huge problem. I'll be glad to chat with you about that. Breaking up drug rings and other terrorist financing rings. These people do not get mad. They get even. So to say the least, we had heavy security. And one of my biggest personal challenge was is I was under close protection 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the entire time I was there. And it got old. And I'm a runner. So you can imagine in the mornings when I wanted to get up and run how much effort that took. Uh, it's not that I am clearly anywhere near the president, but it took a massive amount of planning for yours truly to get up and run in the mornings. Guns, cars, diversionary routes, ambulances, everything. Uh, but by golly, I ran every day, and my close protection team were in pretty good shape after three years. <laughs> I'll leave it at that because I think what I'd rather do in the next 20 minutes is listen to your questions and maybe I can get into more of the personal as well as what was it like kind of stuff. Yes, sir, all the way in the back. We, we do have a mic, uh, so if you'd wait for the mic. Thank you. Uh, could you please compare the reaction you got from the various uh, nations when you were trying to get them to cooperate with, um, this, with this investigation? Excellent. That's called mandate enforcement and a huge challenge. You know, we ha you have a paradox here. We were created by the international community under UN authority, and yet the international community and the UN had trouble cooperating with us. It's the damnedest thing, excuse me. You know, I told them, you know, watch out. I may indict a head of state or two or three, and you know which one it is. Watch out. And then when I signed the indictment in that moving ceremony of Charles Taylor, indictment number one, I sent a, I told and I went to, uh, to London, to Ottawa, to the Netherlands, as well as to the United States in Washington, and I gave them copies, and I said, I just signed it. He is now a war criminal. I'm, going to unseal, I'm not going to seal it. I'm going to keep it sealed until I pick a good time, and I'll let you know when I do that, too. And so, oh, my goodness, you would not believe the hand-wringing, the thumping of chests, the international community was not ready to see only the second sitting head of state in history indicted for war criminals. Who was the first? Real quick, anybody. You get a, you get a free donut if you do. Yeah. Slobodan Milosevic is only the – he was the first sitting head of state. All right. There have been other heads of state who have been deposed and then indicted, but sitting at his desk, indicted. And, of course, Charles Taylor was the first African. I have never seen such – Senior men, grown men, wring their hands and thump their chest. And my biggest challenge was the United States of America, who was very problematic the year after I unsealed the indictment uh, and uh, even tried to cut off the funding of the court because they were mad at me for 
seeking justice for the people of West Africa. So mandate enforcement is a huge problem. It's a huge problem in Rwanda. It's a huge problem in Arusha. Uh, but you just do what you got to do, and right is right, as my dad used to say. Okay? Yes, uh, I know there are a lot of questions. I'll try to get to every one of you. Okay? Uh, yes, ma'am. And I'll get to you too, sir, everybody. Um, you mentioned... You mentioned um, the importance of having this tribunal in Sierra Leone and the advantages of that. What relationship do you see between having that sort of tribunal versus, say, like the International Criminal Court or the International Court of Justice? Do you think they're complementary? Do you think they overlap? Are there any problems with that? I think that's an excellent question. Complementarity, which is really one of the sine qua nons of the uh, ICC. It's one of the key aspects of the Rome Statute. The ICC is a court of last resort. They're not supposed to prosecute every tragedy that takes place. In fact, Louis Ocampo, the chief prosecutor, says, I can't do it. I can only do about two or three a year, if that. So the regional hybrid, international hybrid tribunals, uh, we, Louis and I call it regionalization, fit very nicely into the complementarity aspects of the ICC, which calls for states' parties to prosecute and then if they can't, turn it over to the ICC. I'm being simplistic, but that's generally the, the scenario and the scheme. Well, these new international hybrid tribunals, these regional tribunals, can do just that. Because what happens is, is a, a state party to the ICC who signed it, unless the U.S. has pressured them into unsigning it by withholding aid and, and doing other threatening gestures. Uh, they don't have their court systems. Their court systems usually are burned to the ground. So they can't do it. So what do you do? You have a hybrid which can complement the work of the ICC. So what I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, is we now have a workable model that we can now face down the beast of impunity wherever it rears its ugly head in the 21st century. Yes, sir, you've been very patient. Thank you. Could you give us some background on how you got into international criminal law and kind of what, what kind of got you in on this path, on this road to Africa? I've never been asked that question before. Just kidding. <laughs> Be careful what you wish for. You may get it. I mean, really, you know, you're just starting out in your careers, and I, I can actually remember when I was your age. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. Uh, you know, you will, you will look back 30, 40 years from now, and you'll say, I never thought I would be where I am now when I started out. And... Uh, there are many, many people who I've talked to about this. Just one day on the 27th of August of 2001, a phone call rang at 7 p.m. So you, I've never said this before. At 7 p.m., I was about to sit down with a, a spaghetti dinner with my wife. My children are gone. I thought it was a solicitor. I went, hello. It was the White House. <laughs> they said, you're aware of this new tribunal we're thinking of putting together, and would you like to be the no U.S. nominee for the position? And I very flippantly said, Sure, throw my hat in the ring. And didn't promptly hung up, but uh, they said, well, we, we'll be getting back to you and stuff. And I said, fine. And uh, I hung up, and I, my wife said, who was that? And uh, I said, uh, it was the White House wanted me to know I'd be the nominee for this new position, this chief prosecutor position in West Africa. She started laughing. <laughs> she said, they're never going to appoint an American to do this. And at the same time, we're unsigning the Rome Statute, and the world is angry at us. And I could not, and I personally could not see how they would make an American do, uh, put him in a position like this with this new experiment. Uh, well, guess what? Uh, between, well, between the time I turned in my resume, we had a, very, we had a tragedy called 9-11. And after that all settled down in October, they, uh, I sent my resume in and uh, interviewed and all that stuff, and they sent it off. And six months later, I got a call saying that I had been appointed by Kofi Annan. Now, how did I get here? Well, I just sawed the wood in front of me. Just be damn good at what you're doing. Where did you go to law school? I went to law school at Syracuse University in uh, upstate New York, uh, where we have a lot of snow like you all and yourself. But again, I just uh, served my country. Uh, served mankind, was very, became a very good lawyer, uh, developed a reputation for hard work, and good things happen to good people. Uh, I know that's a simplistic answer, but I think that's really kind of it in a nutshell. Yes? Did you ever see any remorse from the criminals? Yeah, I did. I did. About halfway through their trials. Most of them are finishing up. We're, we're pretty close on, on, 
all of them but Charles Taylor, which is just a start. Uh, some of them stopped coming, which they have a right to do. They don't have to be in court uh, as long as their lawyer is there because they were ashamed because they really began to understand the magnitude uh, of it all. And so despite that they have no souls, uh, there is a little bit of a conscience. Yes, sir. I kind of have two questions real quick. The first one regarding when... Um, one at a time. I'm not that smart. <laughs> exactly. Uh, when Charles Taylor was granted amnesty in Nigeria, um, the Nigerian government, didn't they argue that the immediate removal of him from power was going to cease and stop some of the, I mean, some of the killing or some of the, uh, launched the atrocities that were going on? During yes, that absolutely. Period? Of course, it was, it was not an amnesty. Uh, that's something that's been thrown around. He was just put in a, in a place out of the way. Uh, but it was not a, an amnesty of any way. There's no legal document. There was a, a wink and a nod and a gentleman's agreement between the, the United States, Nigeria, uh, with the concurrence of the U.K. Uh, and the U.N. and the African Union just to get him out of the way. And I called for that and applauded that. Yeah, he needed to get out. Peace needed to start first, then justice. The problem is, is President Bosanjo got paid $5 million from Charles Taylor and suddenly decided not to let him go. And uh, that was... Uh, the rest of my work up until about a week ago to try to get that guy. And secondly, um, last year, I think it was in November, Hassan Jalla was here on campus. Good guy. And I kind of cornered him and I asked him a few Ooh. questions. <laughs> in Sounds a polite serious. way. In oh, a polite okay. way, <laughs> of course. But um, I asked him a few questions about the um, Gachaka system that the Rwandan authorities had been putting together. And he actually seemed, he first talked about how the, the scope of the Rwandan situation and him being called in at the time that he did. He kind of talked about that. But then he seemed sort of optimistic about how even more of a hybrid type court situation the Kachaka court system was. I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that. Well, again, uh, when you have these situations, you're not going to be able to prosecute everybody. In Rwanda, they, uh, uh, even though they're a little bit artful in their approach, they cannot prosecute 120,000 people. There's no country in the world that can do that. So they're doing something that I think is very important and to be respected, and that is uh, use their cultural approaches to this and to get something done versus nothing. And if they can at least get these individuals to admit guilt and do some kind of community service, I know that sounds amazing for cutting somebody to pieces, uh, at least that's something versus nothing, or leaving them to rot in jail. I mean, they're literally uh, like sardines. I mean, it's like uh, uh, they, sh they sleep in shifts because there's no room to lay down. That's not right either. So, again, we need to get these guys out of prison and moving on with uh, so that country can, can move forward. Ma'am, you had a question. Um, well, will, uh, Charles Taylor, will Charles Taylor, uh, will his court be held in, uh, in the Netherlands as it's been petitioned? Yeah. Well, again... And also, oh, I wanted okay. to ask you another. Uh, the new woman president of Liberia... Didn't she serve under Charles Taylor in his uh, in his ministry when he was president there, and the atrocities took place? Well, everybody in some form or another served under Charles Taylor if you were in Liberia because uh, uh, you were either with him or you were against him, and, in the, and if you were against him, usually that ended your life. Uh, so that was one thing. I think that she did have some type of association, but she's always been somewhat in opposition. Uh, as far as Charles Taylor's trial is concerned, uh, Article 4 of the statute allows for the court to do its work anywhere uh, that is appropriate for whatever reason that the president of the court decides, one of which, of course, is security. You know, you're, you have two very fragile countries, Liberia and Sierra Leone, who are on, still on the brink. And uh, the fact Charles Taylor is so feared uh, still, even though he is uh, now under international custody, uh, that, that their thinking is, and we had made this, this plan uh, while I was still there, that uh, potentially to have him go somewhere else for trial. What will happen is, is that the uh, International Tribunal in, uh, in West Africa will just borrow space from uh, the ICC if the Netherlands allows that to happen, uh, and that should be happening soon through a UN Security Council resolution. Uh, we'll just borrow space and we'll try him up there if necessary, but the guy will be tried fairly. Now, I personally would like to see him tried right in front of the people of West Africa there, which again is one of the keys to the success, and as I kind of graphically told you, to see these guys humbled while the victims came in and pointed at them and said, you did this to me, and those type of things is very, very important to the victims as, as much as seeing justice done. So, uh, but again, I can't second guess them because you have to respect uh, the fact of the security of the court. Now, the court is very secure. 
uh, and uh, it could, it, they could do it there. But again, uh, that's not my watch anymore. They'll make the right decisions, and if it's in The Hague, he'll still get a fair trial. Yes, ma'am. Right now, there's a lot of press about Saddam Hussein's trial. And uh, what do you think the main difference is with the press and the attention that that trial is getting versus, say, Milosevic's or Charles Taylor or the situation in Rwanda? What do you think is the key factor for making people care? Well, again, uh, uh, the press is very important. And you know, it's interesting. You know, The special court in Sierra Leone gets great press outside the United States. CNN International. You know, did you know there's a CNN International and a CNN? There are two separate CNNs. CNN International is much more in depth, broader coverage, uh, where CNN is uh, light, fast, and short attention span theater. Uh, where in CNN International is much more. They have pieces that they do, not just 10 second sound bites. Uh, so uh, Reuters, AP. Uh, BBC, uh, Voice of America uh, International uh, provide good coverage. When was the last time you saw something on the special court on Fox, ABC, NBC, or CBS? None. None whatsoever. And uh, I think that's too bad because that's really, uh, you know, it, Americans do care, but Americans don't have any idea. And that's really because the press don't allow you to do that. They, they, they don't tell you about it. So uh, I've gone to uh, uh, to monitor what's been taking place. You can on cable get BBC and CNN International. You just have to look for it. Uh, but that that is a key to success. Right now, uh, Saddam Hussein is is considered the United States show. It's considered in the international community a United States kangaroo court, which will ultimately execute Saddam Hussein in a way that uh, quote justifies uh, uh, that death. But the bottom line is, is that uh, it will be a huge negative in the eyes of the international community. It's not recognized as a, an appropriate court. It's, it's a sad thing because Saddam Hussein uh, is one of the monsters of the 20th century, and it's, a, it's, it's too bad that it's going to be prosecuted in a court that really does not have any international recognition and will always have an asterisk next to it as something that is, is not right. Yes, uh, you've been very patient right there. Yes. And then right behind, yeah. Uh, both of you. Uh, you're, you're both in my line of sight there. <laughs> I'm interested <laughs> in how you go about differentiating between greatest responsibility and most responsibility. Good question. That ultimately is my decision, uh, and that is done with uh, considering both the legal, factual, diplomatic, political, as well as the cultural aspects. And how do I know which greatest responsibility? It's because I went out and asked. I asked them, the people, the victims. Who do you think bears the greatest responsibility? And that certainly is very, very important. Uh, and that's one of the key aspects of that. But ultimately, this chief prosecutor had to make the final decision. And yes, some of these people are going to walk because I had to stick to numbers that were workable under my mandate. Uh, and unfortunately, the, those who are most responsible, the other 100, the two, 300, will probably walk. But that's not my mandate. You have to make them very difficult decisions, but at least you have to show the people uh, in West Africa that the rule of law is fair and it moves efficiently and it's, it's to be respected. The guy here with the Cougars BYU Thanks. sweatshirt. I was just wondering uh, what kind of arguments could the defense possibly have against the prosecution? Good question. What would you? How would you? How would you defend Charles Taylor? What would you? I mean, I, I don't mean me flipping. I, I don't know. I just, it, it's just uh, I know there. Are, you know, they, they get a fair trial and everything like that, but, I mean, it's just what kind of arguments could they possibly have? Well, you know, the standard is beyond a reasonable doubt, and it is certainly, the, and even at the international level, the burden is on the prosecutor to, to prove that, and they're innocent uh, until proven guilty. Uh, well, how would I defend? Well, you know, it's interesting. There are defense, but there are not many, uh, not at the international level, not at international crimes. So, but really the best defense is that the prosecutor didn't prove his case against the various elements of the, uh, the charges. Uh, and that's the burden. <coughs> Excuse me. And hence my point saying you've got to get this right from the very beginning uh, or you will see charges being dropped. But, you know, there are all kinds of ways you do it. I mean, you charge in the alternative. So if we didn't quite prove it on that point, we proved it on that point. Uh, and you can do that uh, legally both here in, in Utah. It's, a, it's an old prosecutorial uh, uh, tactic is you charge in the alternative so that you get them one way or the other. 
uh, legally, of course, but you've got to get it right. You can't, these, guys, these guys will get a fair trial, and if they're acquitted, they're acquitted. But as a prosecutor, the burden is on, on you, a heavy burden, that that doesn't happen. Yes, uh, gosh almighty, I, I'll take whatever questions you have. Uh, yes, please. I was just wondering what you thought about the um, if the situations in Africa, certain parts of Africa, like in the Sudan or DRC, are resolved in a way that would allow for a tribunal. Would you expect to see those tribunals happen and, or occur? And then, would you have any kind of partic would you participate as kind of an advisor or anything in those hmm. tribunals? Uh, no, the answer is I, I, I would I would only do it because. Uh, because I cared, but I don't think I would because it's not fair to my family. I've already been gone too long and seen too many horrors. Uh, but as far as the Darfur situation, this is a classic indifference issue. It's a war crimes worry world. Uh, it's always in Africa, it appears. It's always something that's coming around the corner. Uh, but yet it's just not going away. You know, at one point, this time last year, I was giving a speech in New York, and at the time, at the height of this type of killing and raping, there were a thousand people a day dying in, in Darfur. And again, they're just Africans, so who cares? Uh, we have to do something, and the problem is is that uh, because we have a particular superpower that is not particularly supportive of international criminal justice, uh, it's becoming problematic as far as uh, instead of unifying the, the world to do something about it, it's actually being divisive in those rates. So I don't know what's going to happen in Darfur, to be honest with you. Uh, uh, the killing will continue. The raping is certainly continuing by the, by, the, by the hundreds every day. As I'm speaking, someone is being raped in Darfur, I can assure you, and it's just not ending. Uh, so we're going to have to do something, and I think NATO is going to go in is the last thing I heard because the African Union can't. Uh, the United Nations isn't capable uh, because of it's so stretched so thin and so that uh, NATO may go in to at least stabilize the situation. Now, what happens after you have peace whether there's justice, I'm not sure. As you know, the ICC now has the portfolio uh, and has the mandate to prosecute them, but first you have to have the peace. Eventually, I think it'll happen, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be years. Yes, sir, you've been very patient in the back there. You've had a chance to travel around Africa. Would you consider yourself an Afro-optimist or pessimist? An Afro-pessimist. Yes, sir. That usually gets a rise out of some people. It seems that we've seen some differing, differing threads or themes with um, indifference in Darfur, for instance, but we also see a lot of attention to hold people accountable. Um, so no, we no longer have dictators like Idi Amin hanging out in Saudi Arabia. So how do you account for um, greater attention um, to, that, that's been focused on bringing former warlords and former heads of state to justice? Well, what you do is you, uh, you bring people to, like Charles Taylor, the most powerful warlord in Africa, and see him step off that helicopter in chains. It sends a huge, huge signal to the rest of the good old boy network in Africa uh, who use their citizens for their own personal criminal gain uh, by the tens of thousands. That has sent a shudder. The indictment scared him. This has now sent a shudder. This is the beginning of the beginning of the end of impunity in uh, in Africa and in other parts of the world too. It is now the cornerstone. Uh, he's only the second head of state in, in history and the first head of state in Africa. So it, it, it is huge. And I think it, we don't know what the ripple effect will be, but I can assure you it was not a good day for Robert Mugabe of Zimbabwe. Yes, ma'am. Um, you mentioned blood diamonds. I would like to hear a little bit more about conflict diamonds within, and issues within um, Sierra Leone. You got a day? <laughs> Conflict diamonds are a major problem. Uh, I knew about that, but when I went there, I didn't realize what a huge and horrific problem it was. It largely financed the entire civil war in the Mano River region, which is Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone, which resulted in 1.2 million human beings destroyed. Uh, there are alluvial diamonds in eastern Sierra Leone, and one of the basic reasons for the cause of the conflict was to take over those diamond fields so that they could fuel the overall geopolitical uh, strategy of Muammar Gaddafi to take over West Africa and place surrogates in each of the countries. And they were going to use the diamonds to fuel that particular concept. And so uh, 
Uh, he was the second head of state I was about to indict. I didn't for political reasons, my reasons. I didn't want to see the entire special court ended by an angry United States and United Kingdom and others because I indicted another head of state. But Muammar Gaddafi is an unindicted co-conspirator and clearly listed in the indictment of Charles Taylor as that. So we've named and shamed him, uh, but uh, a huge problem. Blood diamonds are a problem. The Kimberly process is the fox guarding the chickens. And unfortunately, there is no real, I mean, I, I got into the diamond industry and really started getting into it because I realized diamonds uh, were the main red thread throughout this process. Uh, very closed society. A lot of things are done not by contracting and writing, but by handshakes. It's controlled by about six families that have been doing this for 100 years. Did you know that diamonds are so common that uh, they're as common as carbon, that, that uh, they're manufactured, placed in a huge vault in London, there's about $4.5 billion worth at the last time I checked, and they parcel them out. Did you know also the largest consumer of diamonds in the world, 70% of them, is? Guess. Yes, you're right. Did you know that the diamonds are a girl's best friend? You know who started that? I love those commercials. You know, you're sitting there watching, da-da-da-da, you know, and it brings tears to your eyes. You know, and if you love your wife, your fiancé or what have you, you will give her a diamond. You know how many percentage of blood diamonds are on the market that the Kimberley process or the, uh, the, the mining, mining industry tells you? Four, four percent. You know what it really is? Between 25 and 30 percent. So you decide about the diamond. Now, what you can do is you can seek certification. There is a process, and if you are about to be engaged or have just been engaged, or and I don't mean to uh, spoil a just recent engagement here, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> But and congratulations if you're out there. But my point is, is that you can be a conscience, or I mean, a conscientious consumer, and see the certificate of the diamond. Uh, technically, it will show that will probably make it less likely that it is a blood diamond. But it's a huge market. You know, the alluvial diamonds are just that; they leach to the surface. It's not like the Kimberley process, where you go down a mile, two miles, to get these things. They, you dig down three feet, and you're in diamonds. And when you go to the Kono district uh, and uh, where the diamond fields are, it's like going to the – it like, looks like the moon, all the craters. Now, what you do during the war, and we charged them with enslavement, is they would bring in people from all over West Africa, chain them to the pits, feed them only enough to keep them digging, and when they died, threw them in an, a larger pit called Savage Waters by the tens of thousands – and uh, they would manufacture the diamonds, give them to Charles Taylor, who would uh, give them cash, and uh, he would take the diamonds and use them to buy weapons, for, put them in his own account, or uh, use them to uh, assist uh, Hamas and Al-Qaeda to, uh, to wash funds uh, to include a large amount of diamonds moving to the Middle East, to Afghanistan, in July of 2001. So again, diamonds are a major problem, uh, and they're a huge problem in West Africa. And, and in my mind, uh, were, the result was uh, the destruction of 1.2 million people. Well, you can certainly go into the Kimberley process. You can. Uh, uh, there's a great book by Doug Farah, uh, "Blood from Stones." Farah, F-A-R-A-H. Yeah, I don't get a commission for this. Uh, he is a personal friend, and I will see him tomorrow, and I'll tell him I did this. So he owes me, uh, he owes me a, a, a watch or something. But no, the key is, is it's a very good book, and it shows the funding of this whole whole tragedy that took place in West Africa. Very a very accomplished Washington Post reporter who got it right. Actually, he's about he's very accurate uh, in in that process. Let me go back to the back of the room. Yes, sir. Yeah, you said that the United States was one of your main opponents of establishing this tribunal or of indicting Charles Taylor. Why, does the, why did they oppose it? Well, it, it, no, the U.S. was one of the main uh, uh, drafters of the, uh, uh, of the Special Court for Sierra Leone. In fact, Ambassador David Sheffer, uh, a very good friend of mine, who was here. He was here. He was here, actually, just speaking a couple of weeks ago. Uh, was the original drafter of the statute, and then uh, he was able to take it and so sell it to the rest of the international community because they weren't going to create an ad hoc. You know, they cost $125 million per year per tribunal. Uh, so it ha we had to do this more efficiently and effectively. Uh, so, yes, but 
you know, the United States does not like international criminal justice, but they knew they had to do something about uh, about this tragedy, and they didn't want to do a haddock because they were too they were too uh, expensive. So they they created this. Uh, their big concern was is that uh, uh, they have an international prosecutor who literally has the power to bring down any head of state as long as they had the jurisdiction over a particular crime, and I could prove that they were involved in the issue. Uh, they don't like that. And I can remember just after I had indicted Charles Taylor, after warning them, uh, I was talking to a very senior uh, member of the Bush administration who said, you know, uh, you're doing great work there, Dave, uh, but we think you're succeeding just a little too well. And I said, well, uh, Mr. Blank, you picked the wrong guy. And because, again, I may be an American, but I have a mandate at the international level to seek justice, and I think that's very, very critical. And uh, that's my job. And uh, sadly, I've served my country in many places uh, to include risking my life for my country, to see my country trying to undermine uh, the work uh, of a very court that they helped set up. It's a paradox. Remember, it's the strangest thing in the world. You, they set it up, but yet they don't want it to happen. And uh, again, the bottom line is, is they finally, the, the Bush administration has finally gone on the right side of the fence here in a, over about a year, and they were very, very... Uh, uh, strong and effective in, in getting Charles Taylor finally uh, turned over to the court. Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 I worry oh, about how long we're going to go on here. Uh, we, we could probably go on forever. Um, That's your call. Uh, um, <laughs> and, and I appreciate, I mean, we've done a lot of good work here and learned a lot of things. Uh, we do have other things on his agenda, though, and I think we better wrap this up. So let's give him a hand. Thank you.